All right, so we have our community here. We've, we've, uh, we've done educational stuff for them. You've been uh, uh, an important part of that on our fire safe part. And uh, we've been trying to put our message out about fire safe stuff. So you've got a situation here where you've been following them and you've been, uh, you know, you can see by the construction you do and, and how you uh, arrange things, you've designed fire safety into your place. And that's what we're trying to get other people to do too. Yeah, I guess it's very fascinating for me, someone who's been in fire for a career 61 years now, and I used to just read about this in books and help other people do it. And now I'm in a position where with a new cabin three or four years ago, I decided to build my cabin so it would be fire safe. And, and I had uh, shale landscaping instead of bark mulch. And I put on a metal roof to keep the embers from burning a shake roof down when a fire comes. And I put my propane tank <laughs> over 50 feet away from my place to keep it out of harm's way. And I guess I also put on a Trex deck. And naively, I thought because Trex was not wood, it wouldn't burn. But then someone said, no, it does burn. It will ignite, but it yeah. takes unusual That's right. Conditions. You're not going to have to worry too much about that. The composite decking materials, they don't want to burn, yeah. and they have to have a lot of fire around them. So as long as you've created, like you say, the shale, you've interrupted that, that flow of fire. It can't get to there with any kind of energy that's going to cause it to, to burn. Now, if your house burns, sure, the, the composite deckling will burn with it, but it probably won't get to that yeah. point. And you've cleared so much around here. The, the thinning here has been tremendous. Granted, you had to do it because of the beetle kill, but you're not going to get the ferocity of fire in here that normally you would have seen. You're right. When I first bought this place, and that was back in 1975 from Earl Cooley, who made the first smoke jump in history <laughs> back in 1940 and became a realtor, but I bought the property. This was a dense forest then, mm -hmm. and it would have been very ripe for a crown fire. And now, I guess, thanks to the beetles, uh, they've selected the trees that I cut down and then burned up the slash. So this forest now offers a very more manageable kind of fire behavior. As a firefighter, you know, as a fire officer, I would not have a problem with sending a crew in here to babysit this. You've done the work and all they have to do is make sure that the little things that happen, little ember that falls on a little bit of litter near the house that starts a little bit of flame, they'll be here. But I feel good about leaving them here because they're not in danger. They can handle this. This is safe for them. Yeah, you brought up a really interesting point. We used to call it defensible space, but after fires like Yarnell and others, we know that what it really permits for the firefighter is survivable space. That mm -hmm. if the firefighter is here, that the space is actually survivable by a human being, mm -hmm. in addition to providing a safe kind of fire behavior scenario where they can effectively fight fire. And, you know, I encourage, if, if people have the right mentality, if they've done the work on their property, I like them to stay on their property because I don't have enough fire crews for every house. I'd like them to stay on their property and just doing the walk around, making sure everything's okay. Yeah, it's gonna be smoky, it might be hot, might be scary. Mm -hmm. But like here, it's not gonna be very scary because you've already done the work. It's the whole thing, prepare your property yeah. uh, and then either go early really early right or you just stay there and and keep an eye on things because there are some things that you missed you oh yeah so you take your little bucket and your mop and you swat that down and you're good and then you go inside for a cool drink of water and mm -hmm. clean air and and then maybe 15 to 30 minutes later you come out and walk around again i like i like that i tell you what i learned in 2012 when our district was threatened by the mustang fire allen that 350,000 mm -hmm. acre fire that came at us out of the salmon river and what i realized then as i started looking around my property again in the middle of the fire season you're never done preparing it's it's a work in progress and i did a little more weed whacking and i looked up on my roof and realized even though it's a metal roof there were a lot of pine needles up there so i got the pine needles off the roof and it's just the constant maintenance and upkeep kind of mentality to keep you out of harm's way it, it's really it becomes a lifestyle yes you keep your place clean you know you look after that stuff and as a consequence you live in a really nice place yeah it's yeah, all true clean. yes yeah yeah, the housekeeping for the fire gives you a aesthetic surrounding for enjoying each day. Mm -hmm.
And I notice, you know, this time of year, we're all green. We're just past the our, our wet flood season. Grasses are all greened up. In a month or two, they'll all start turning brown. You'll start seeing them, you know, the the red seed heads and all that. And then it becomes a fire issue. And but if you can keep up on it, if you can be doing your weeding while the grass is green, you don't have to worry about anything. And it's a lot nicer to be cutting in because it's nice and cool out here. When it gets hot, when there's a fire threatening, when there's smoke in the air, that's not the best time to be doing it. You want to be doing it throughout the spring and mm. the summer uh, to keep on top of things. Yeah, true. And keeping on top of things makes one realize, I guess, that it's just not an individual strategy. It's a community strategy because mm -hmm. even though I might do all the right things here, if my neighbor upwind of me allows standing dead trees with needles all over the place, for more embers, then I'm threatened even though I've done everything well here. That's a great point, because you do have that issue with your neighbor. He has not care taken care of his property. So yeah, you have to be more concerned with flying embers. So yeah, you don't have continuous fuels to your building. You've done really well with that, but you can't control the thing that's coming through the air, trying to lodge in some nasty little place and, and catch on fire. But because you've done the rest of the work, you can, you can pay attention to that stuff. And if you're here, You'll, you'll be here to catch those things. Yeah, true. Yeah, I think that's so important to tie everybody in the community together, too, mm -hmm. so that it's not only the strength of the individual, but the strength of all of the individuals working together. Well, I, I know in our community, we have people, their neighbors may not be, be there year-round, mm -hmm. but they're more than willing to walk over there and check on their property, even during a fire. And it mm -hmm. happened, in the fires of 2000, it happened a lot, I know. They, they're willing to kind of care for their neighbor if they're not there to do it mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. So even if people evacuate often, you have that neighbor who's going to come over and say, oh, look at that, and they jump on this, you know, little tiny fire. That would have mm -hmm. been a problem if somebody hadn't been watching it. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, it's the little things that make a difference. And I have friends in Australia that have stayed and defended a house in the eucalyptus fires, and they often def talk about defending their home with a a mop bucket and a wet mop and mm -hmm. going around inside the house or sometimes embers go through a keyhole in the door that they didn't tape shut. Mm -hmm. Low tech works really well. Yeah. With us, with the fire company, we have all kinds of different pumps and hose and nozzles and vehicles and all that stuff. Well, we have failures all the time. Mm -hmm. And so if a homeowner is depending on a powered pump system, I don't know. Yeah. I wouldn't do it. It's not going to get used mm -hmm. enough to be sure that it's going to work when they need it. So the bucket and the mop. Yeah. Having buckets of water just on the four Scattered. corners of your house so you always have access to it, it's quick. It I, makes that, a difference. That makes much yeah. more sense to me. Yeah.